Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. Hi, my name is Ryan Nilsson, and on behalf of CLB North American Mission, I want to thank you for your partnership in our shared ministry. We plan to give you updates from each of our church plants in the months to come, but for now, we wanted to share with you a quick update on what's happening with our church plants here in North America, one of the largest mission fields in the world. Epiphany Lutheran Church has faced a number of challenges common to city ministry, but COVID impacted this New York church significantly. This past November, the church held its final public worship service for the time being and said farewell to its founding pastor, Eric Sorensen. Despite these massive changes, the church continues on. With support from North American Mission and mentoring and spiritual oversight from local CLB pastor, Andy Olson, three lay people from the church have been commissioned to lead the next chapter of ministry as a missional community or microchurch. They've started meeting together in an apartment for worship, fellowship, discipleship, and engagement in their local mission field. Pray for these leaders as they continue the ministry of the church during the challenges COVID presents in the city. During the COVID pandemic, Cultivate New England, the partnership of our three New England CLB churches, was able to assess, candidate, and call Pastor Christian Anderson and his wife, Mary. They've accepted the call and are moving to New England in February. They'll serve in a pre-launch residency at Bethany in East Heartland, Connecticut, with plans to move to the Boston area in mid-2022. Please pray for Mary and Christian as they move, settle into New England, and begin to prepare for church planting. Grace LBC in Bismarck, North Dakota, has continued to reach into the neighboring community of Lincoln, providing a weekly kids program with the dream of expanding this ministry into a church. North American Mission is helping fund this vision, allowing Pastor Ryan Norland to spend more time in Lincoln. Despite the disruption of COVID, Pastor Ryan has found ways to continue the kids ministry as an outdoor program. As the weather cools, Ryan is now focusing on building relationships with the 130 families that have already been a part of this program. Thanks to help from local donors, a CLB church that closed and wanted to leave a legacy, and support from you as a CLB, we've purchased land in this young, growing neighborhood with the desire to build a community center that will allow our mission to Lincoln to expand. New Hope has been gathering in several small groups and homes, and when COVID hit, Pastor Jason Rogan has shifted in-person gatherings to online ones. Over the summer, the groups were able to begin meeting again. Pastor Jason has been able to meet with several men for discipleship and has even seen a new profession of faith. This fall and winter, he's working to begin discipleship groups that focus on equipping other leaders to make disciples. Jason's goal is to reach a critical mass large enough to sustain weekly worship services. Even as we face new challenges from COVID, we're preparing for the next church plans God has in store for us. We're assessing and training potential church planters and developing systems to sustain higher rates of church planning in the future. We're looking for congregations and individuals who want to help plant more churches. If that's you, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you about working together in this mission field where God has placed us. Thank you for joining together in God's mission. Our scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, reading in Jesus' name. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love 
and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able as we continue in worship. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to Him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to Him. Let's try this together. Jesus said if I'm weak. Jesus said, if I am weak, I should come to Him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to Him. For the Lord is good and faithful, He will keep us there. run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to
I was getting ready to preach this week, I was reminded of, uh, of a family trip we took when the kids were young. Uh, back then, uh, as a young pastor, vacations were basically shaped not by where we wanted to go, but where we were often invited to go, especially if it was a long trip. And I had been invited to speak at a youth gathering uh, on the West Coast, so that meant, hey, we got to go to the West Coast. And it was it was very memorable. Uh, one of the first memories is uh, that we had just had uh, traded a van and we had a quote new van, kind of like in a young pastor way, probably had under 100,000 miles on it. Anyway, um, as we were headed out and we were past Wapaton heading for Sioux Falls and the speedometer went out. So here we had uh, a trip ahead of us to the west coast with no speedometer, which became kind of interesting because I, I would watch people make sure I wasn't passing any more than I was getting past and just kind of driving by intuition. That wasn't a big deal. We had thought about where could we get a reasonable room for the night for a family of six. So we pulled in about 11 o'clock into a place as we were nearing the, the, the west coast and I walked in and, and, and said to the desk clerk, uh, do, do we have reservation? He said, yes, we do. And the kids had been in the car a long time. So I said, yeah, what time does the pool close? And he looked at me with this like, are you serious? This is Vegas. <laughs> so I realized the kids could swim all night if they wanted to. But what I remember about that stopover in, in Las Vegas is as we were coming into town and driving through, my kids' eyes were as big as half dollars, I'm sure, looking back there. And, and we had a taxi pull up alongside of us. And uh, on top of the taxi was an advertisement. And that advertisement was for a type of entertainment that we will just say was was not wholesome, okay? And, and so I heard a, a little voice come from the back uh, of, of the van saying, Dad, this place really needs Jesus, doesn't it? I said, yeah, buddy, this place needs Jesus. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how the life and message of Jesus transforms cities. And I'm not picking on Las Vegas as a city. There are some beautiful things happening within the city of Las Vegas. And like most cities, we're a mix of the, of the beautiful and the, and the broken. But we are going to uh, be taking a look at a, at, at a chapter or, or a uh, episode in the book of Acts that very dramatically and powerfully reminds us that the life and message of, message of Jesus, although it won't transform a whole city, it does a beautiful, important, powerful work in a city that not only transforms the lives of some of its citizens, but goes on to be a blessing in, in, in that city. And, and so um, as we're talking about how Jesus transformed hearts, we visited the story of Zacchaeus that, that that greedy little crooked tax collector. And Jesus wasn't backing away from his story. He moved into his story. And, and by the end of that story, we saw uh, a heart transformed and a life transformed. Last week, Pastor Doug shared with us that, that prayer can, can play such an important part in inviting God in to transform a home. And, and, uh, and we were encouraged by that. But this week, we're gonna take a look at the power of the gospel and the transforming it 
it, work that it does in a city. You know, the book of Acts is basically a recounting of, of what Jesus said would happen. Jesus said that, that after he died and he rose again from the dead, and he, he, he said, and especially after, as he was getting ready to go to heaven, he said that, that this gospel, this good news of what his death and resurrection meant, and by the way, as we will see today, that's really the core of the gospel message of Jesus. What does his death mean? What does his resurrection mean? And how can that make a difference in my life? We are gonna see that uh, as in the, in the book of Acts, that, that the apostles went from city to city to city, just as Jesus said, beginning in Jerusalem, into Samaria, into Judea, and, and to the ends of the earth. We're going to take a look today at um, a city that, well, <laughs> this city had a reputation, okay? It was, it, was a long, it, was a, it was a prosperous city, but it was also a decadent city. In fact, it would not be a stretch to say in that part of the world, in that time in history, it probably had a reputation of being a sin city. And we're talking about the city of Corinth. It was a place that really needed Jesus. And it's a place that God uh, inspired and prompted the Apostle Paul to bring them the message that would transform their lives. I'm going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 18, beginning with verse 1, reading in Jesus' name. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and he worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and he went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Athens may be a more well-known city than uh, than Corinth in ancient Greek. Athens was a center of Greek culture and philosophy. It was also the birthplace of the Olympics. And we're going to visit Athens later this summer, Lord willing, as, as a congregation, we're going to go through uh, the, the book of Acts. But let's just say for now that, that uh, Corinth was just a, a beautiful drive along the coast, not that far from Athens. It was a prosperous city of 500 to 650,000 people. It had a diverse uh, uh, population, a collection of native Greeks, uh, Romans who had made their way over uh, to, to settle in this beautiful area. And also like most uh, cities in, in that part of the world, there was a small Jewish community. This is, this is the, the, the population base where the, where the church of Corinth would one day uh, grow. Paul came to Corinth and, and it had been recently rebuilt by Julius Caesar after being destroyed some hundred years earlier by the Romans. It was commercially prosperous, prosperous and morally decadent. According to one scholar, it had a notorious reputation for sexual license, which had spawned a new word to Corinthianize. To Corinthianize meant to engage in immoral activity. The temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, perched 1,500 feet above the town, was surrounded by uh, prostitutes, a thousand of them, who served, quote, the religious practices of the Corinthians. Now think about that. What do you think that had to do with the Corinthians' understanding of love. 
at the goddess of the temple of love, all kinds of darkness was being practiced. So the one who came to seek and to save the lost, St. Paul, who settled into Corinth to work and share about the life and message of Jesus. This city really needed him. The devil was very busy in Corinth. Now, the first thing we notice in verses 1, and 1 through 4 is how the gospel came to Corinth in a not very spectacular way. It reminds us of Jesus. John said that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us as Jesus came into this world. Basically, he kind of slipped into this world and, and we see Paul more or less slipping into Corinth. He lived among them. He comes to town and he meets a couple of Jewish friends who happen to be tent makers like he was. So he settles in with them and goes about the business of making tents and, of course, sharing his heart. His friends Aquila and Priscilla, like many Jews then and now, had, had been uh, uh, the victims of anti-Semitism. They, they, they had experienced persecution. Emperor Claudius had banished them from Rome. So they basically moved to this prosperous city whose marketplace in the center of the city was among, among the largest in that part of the world, and they made tents. Could you imagine working long days alongside the Apostle Paul? It's interesting, the Apostle Paul just couldn't help but share the good news of Jesus. We're told that when he was under arrest in Rome, by the time he had been there a while, the whole Roman community around him knew about Jesus. Could you imagine guarding Paul and not somehow coming under conviction of your sin and coming to know Jesus? Well, at some point in this relationship, Priscilla and Aquila came to know Jesus too and would become an important part of the future of Paul's work, missionary work, as, as they too would become partners in the gospel. Working six days a week and on Sunday going to the synagogue, engaged in the regular life and rhythm of the city. But at the synagogue, Paul tried to convince those who gathered that Jesus was the best news ever. You see, Paul had ex personally experienced a transformation he had begun his life as a young star, rising star amongst his uh, Jewish people. And he was passionate about somehow putting an end to this dangerous movement that was centered around this Jesus until he met Jesus personally, or shall we say Jesus met him and his life was changed. He understood why Jesus died. He understood what the resurrection of Jesus meant for him and for all who would believe. He had, he had met Jesus personally, the one who lives and reigns and is coming again. Now things get a little more interesting in verses 5 and 6. When the friends he had been waiting for in Athens, Silas and Timothy, finally show up as, as he's in Corinth. But it was worth the wait. We understand by reading other parts of Paul's letters that when they came from Corinth, they came with a very generous gift to Paul. The Macedonians later on would be known, what a beautiful way to be known, for their generosity. They now were sharing in the mission in Corinth, not so much by their presence, but by their generosity. Paul then now had the freedom to preach full time, and that's when things got <laughs> rocking. He reminded again and again his Jewish friends that Jesus straight up was the Messiah promised by God with his full and, 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 and accurate understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Paul reminded them over and over in, in places like Isaiah that he was the, he was the, the lamb that was slain, that, that God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And, 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 and yet he was met by hard hearts. Maybe it's important to, to mention at this time that no one has argued into the kingdom of God. Certainly we share the truth as clearly as we can. But for someone to come to transformational saving faith at some point, there is, there is a work in the heart that submits to the truth about Jesus and trusts it with a believing heart. That was not happening in the Jewish community where Paul was preaching. He would be met with rejection. By the way, this wasn't the first time. This was the pattern that Paul had experienced up, up till this point and now his second missionary journey. 
So why did he persist in bringing the gospel first to his Jewish brethren, his, his brothers and sisters? It's because of two things, I believe. One is that God had made a promise to Abraham that Abraham's descendants would one day be a great nation and every nation of the earth would be blessed through him. And so with that sense of being a bearer of God's promise-keeping message, Paul went to his Jewish brothers and sisters. Second thing, and this makes it harder, I honestly believe that Paul loved his Jewish brothers and sisters. He said this in, in Romans in that section where he talks about about is really his heartache for Israel in their stubborn refusal to yield their hearts to Jesus. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Let's stop here for a minute. Many of us, perhaps you, we know Jesus. And we have people that we love, perhaps in close relationship, our extended family or like family. And they don't know Jesus. At least they don't know him yet. And we know how much they need Jesus. And on top of that, we know how much Jesus loves them. And so we pray. We pray. It's not easy. I don't know if I've ever felt like Paul did that I would give up my relationship with Christ if they could have what I have. But Paul lived with that ache in his heart. So Paul is kicked out of the synagogue. That may seem like the bad news, but for the Gentiles in Corinth, this was actually good news. Paul moved next door to the synagogue and, and he shares Jesus from the home of a Gentile guy named Titius Justus who was a worshiper of, worshiper of God. And let's stop on that for a moment. We aren't told that he was a believer in Jesus, but he was a worship, worshiper of God. In every community, God is already at work. In the hearts and minds of those who have somehow, through the witness of nature, through, through hearing about, uh, about the goodness of God, um, maybe dreams, maybe visions. Titius Justice was a worshiper of, worshiper of God. In the Old Testament, we read that those who seek him shall find him, Jeremiah said, when we seek him with all our heart. This was a really good day for Titius Justice as he would come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. God loves to do this. So what actually did Paul preach? If we were going to listen to Paul preach this, quote, good news or this gospel, by the way, gospel means good news, what exactly was that? If, if, you, if someone was, were going to ask you, so you talk about the gospel, the gospel, what is this gospel? Later in a letter to the Corinthians, Paul said this, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. I think it's really important to remember that this was not a theological uh, premise that Paul was preaching. He was simply declaring what happened and the significance of what happened. As the scriptures had, had foretold, the, 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 the Savior would suffer, the Savior would die, but he would conquer death for us. He would rule and he would reign and that he would come again. And that, that we are living in a time, you and I are living in the same time that the Corinthians were, where God is bringing this good news to, to people like us. And with that good news comes the power to transform our hearts. This is what was happening in Corinth. But there's more. 
And moving out of the synagogue, the synagogue leader, Crispus, the synagogue leader, slips next door and listens and continues to listen to Paul. And God opens this guy's heart to the gospel. And he and his whole Jewish family believe in the Lord Jesus. I'm thinking that this was absolutely encouraging for Paul to see a Jewish brother come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah of the world. I say that to encourage you, don't give up on praying for family members and loved ones who have not yet come to trust Jesus. And I encourage you to continue beating them over the head with your Bible. Just kidding. Just kidding. But love them as Jesus loved them and be ready to give an answer when they're ready to ask you about your hope in Jesus. Jesus loves to find our lost loved ones and save them. But there's more. Notice the last part of verse 8. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. These people needed Jesus and Jesus came to them as Paul simply told them about who Jesus is and why he came. This is why God sent Paul to Corinth. This is what transformation looks like when the life and the message of Jesus come to a place like Corinth or your community or my community. Listen to how Paul, in a letter he would later write to, to the Corinthians, put it. He said, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Yes, these Corinthians, in believing the good news about Jesus, had been declared righteous. I were now considered holy, <laughs> even though they had so much to learn about this life in Christ. You see, they had been redeemed. As it is written, Paul said, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 6 of that same letter, he would say to his Corinthian friends, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? By the way, these guys had a ton to learn. This comes in in a section where Paul is, is saying, Hey, people, Christians don't sue Christians, okay? What kind of witness is that in the community? Come on. And then he goes on to say, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He's not just slamming the neighbors of these people in Corinth. Listen, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is beautiful transfer, transformation. John said in, in, in his first letter that Jesus came to undo the works of the devil. We see these people getting called out of the darkness of the kind of controlling issues and strongholds in their life and being freed in the gospel. As Paul would put it in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Talk about transformation. These people in this city really needed Jesus. And Jesus really loved saving them. And now he was determined to keep them as his own believing children in a very challenging city to live as believers in Jesus. Is Jesus able not only to bring to faith, but to mature in the faith? A group of people living in a place like Corinth? Absolutely but would it be easy? Absolutely not. We have more uh, biblical literature addressed to this city than any other city in the Bible. 
And as we are going to see here, Paul understood that in order to be faithful in the transformational work of the gospel, it's more than just a moment of conversion. It's a learning to live into this wonderful identity we now have in Christ. There's no surprise this church would, have, would require a huge investment in time and love and in discipling in the days ahead. You see, God had come to rob the enemy of souls right in the midst of a city that was in the grips of his deceptive darkness. Understand that when the gospel prevails, the kingdom of darkness loses. And until he's banished forever to the bottomless pit, he does not always give up without a fight. But God is up to the challenge. Jesus is jealous for his own. I say that because if you have a stronghold or a life-controlling issue or a need of healing from, from some of the dark things in your past, you can be pretty sure that that issue you're dealing with is probably addressed somewhere in the letter that Paul would write to the Corinthians. God is able to take that and, and do what only he can do with it, break its power in the name of Jesus. And because of their struggles, there were letters prompted that give us hope in dealing with our struggles, that the transformation that came to Corinth might continue in the lives of ordinary people like you and me. I don't know how many times I have found this verse that was first written to the Corinthians trying to live out this new life in Christ in a very difficult place. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul wrote, No temptation has overtaken you, except which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is, this is beautiful. On that city, on, the, on that high point in the city was, was the temple to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. Oh, what a warped, warped um, understanding and experience of love. But God was something do, doing something beautiful and bringing transformation to the city of Corinth. He had called a people to himself and he had loved them out of the dark. He declared to them that, that, that they were now not only loved by him, but they had a very simple mission in this broken world. They were to love each other, that, all, that people might know that they are his disciples. In fact, it would be to this, again, to the Corinthians as they needed to learn to grow in this. You think of the concept of love that was in their past. And Paul wrote these beautiful words to them as he redefined love for them. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. That beautiful description some would say not just in the bible but in literature there's probably no more beautiful description of love we know this love emanates from the heart of god and was reflected in the life of jesus it's found in first corinthians 13 1 through 8. yes there was still the temple of aphrodite with that dark deception and regarding love but now there was a, a new community that had, had been formed and it, and, and it was growing and, and it was struggling, but it was persevering around the good news of Jesus. We listen, we remember what Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that, may, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Yes, there was a new city on the hill, so to speak. Not literally, but in that city now, the gospel had come. The kingdom of God had come. And with it was the good news that had transformed their lives and would have the potential to transport others. 
the last couple of verses in our text, and this, with this we close. It says that one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we have no idea how deep and wide, how rich, how strong is your love for us. And not for just those who are your own, but for those who are living now in darkness, whose lives are ready to be transformed by the good news of Jesus. Father, when we think of a relationship with you through your son Jesus, often we think of that personally. But you, would you give us a glimpse of how you see our neighbors, how you see our city, that we might experience the, the joy of seeing the transformation that only the good news of Jesus makes possible as it is clearly shared and received in a believing heart. Father, I don't know that uh, most cities are getting, quote, more holy these days. There's darkness all around us, but thank you that you have given us the light. You have called us as churches. Here in the community where we live and wherever Christians gather around your globe, you have called us to be that place where the light shines, where the salt seasons and preserves. Give us grace to let our good works point others to you that you might receive glory. Father, we, we pray for our city. And wherever we're gathered now uh, on this online uh, worship time, we just pray that you would give us, as your people, a heart for the cities where you've placed us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so glad you joined us online today. We hope you encountered the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ during our time together. If you've been blessed by our mission and ministry here online, we'd love for you to partner with us in some practical ways that make this online mission possible. You can share this service with your friends and family, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or support our mission financially if that's what you're feeling led to do. Giving online is really simple. Visit us at triumphlbc.org giving. We appreciate your generosity as we continue to see God at work through our ministry without borders. Now, not only in our local communities, but across our world and nation. So, before you go, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve your Lord.